church we're in. Everybody give God a hand for the church that you're in right now. Oh, I love that song. I want to invite you to reach and grab your copy of God's Word. Turn to John chapter 10. Uh, as we continue in a series, we started all the way back on Easter weekend, Resurrection weekend, uh, entitled The I Am's of Christ. And uh, today we're going to look at two different ones, but that first week we looked at Jesus' I Am, where he identified with the Father. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Then two weeks ago, we looked at I am the bread of life. Last week, I am the light of the world. And today we look at two from John chapter 10. And we're going to cover both of them because they're all in the same chapter where Jesus says, I am the door or the gate. We're going to read it here in a second. And he says, I'm also the good shepherd. You know, when we think about those two together, take the door. We're all very familiar with doors. I don't know what your front door looks like. You might not know or probably don't know what my front door looks like. But we think of a door as something that we, we shut at night. We lock it at night to keep the thieves out. Well, that is a reality. That when we look at what we're going to see today, talking about a sheep pen, they basically had a door in their sheep pens, but we're going to see was an individual. And so there are always people who are competing for our attention that are always wanting to come in and out, move in and out. The door he's talking about is the door to our life. I mean, we sometimes let bad people into our lives, and we at least want Jesus at our door to kind of slow down the traffic, right? And so Jesus says, I am am the door. But he also then says, I am the good shepherd. So as we think about Jesus is the door, what does that mean? We're going to look at that. And he goes, also, I am the good shepherd. He says, really, I'm the only shepherd that you need. I am the one that you truly need. And we're going to read here in a second, several times, Jesus say, I know, it says, I know my sheep and my sheep know my voice. And sheep do know the shepherd's voice. You know, even within infants or child, if you're a lady here and, and you know that uh, from the moment your child is born, your infant can identify your voice. And if the father has talked a lot, uh, uh, the infant can identify the father's voice. And it just kind of seems kind of interestingly in, in the development of a child is from about zero to 13, they can hear mom and dad's voice well. But at 13, the sheep develop a parental earwax, how many of you know, that filters out. So when you begin to talk to your kids, it, it's like they can hear every friend anywhere, everywhere, every commercial, everything they see on Instagram or Facebook uh, or TikTok. But the voice they can't hear is yours. And then about 22 to 25 years, that earwax falls out. And Jesus is saying exactly the same thing in John chapter 10 is that my sheep know my voice. They don't always listen to it, but they know it. And I think it's interesting as we take ourselves back to what Jesus is talking about, that Jesus uses the idea of sheep to refer to us. My guess is if your child was growing up and, you know, there, maybe a teacher would ask them, draw a picture of what you want to be when you grow up. Kids would draw a picture or I would, uh, I want to be a lion. I want to be a, a leopard. I want to be an elephant. Maybe I want to be a zebra. No kid says I want to be a sheep when I grow up. They just don't. You ever gone to a circus and they said, hey, come see our trained sheep? They don't. Man, you go see trained elephants or zebras or monkeys or lions, but you don't go look for trained sheep. So I think it's interesting that Jesus refers to us as sheep. Because what do we know about sheep? They are stubborn, they are defenseless, and they are in desperate need of a shepherd. I'm not going to get too far into your business, but let's get into mine. Sometimes I am stubborn, anybody else like me. When it comes to Satan's schemes, from time to time, I am defenseless. And all the time, I desperately need a good shepherd. And so as we walk through John chapter 10, I want to start off by doing this. I want to show you the first two I am's. I am the door, the gate. I am the good shepherd. Then I want to take you to the end of the story and say after the conversation, how do the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day respond? And then I want to pull out five timeless truths 
from those two I am's. So let's go to John chapter 10, verse 7, put it up. Hopefully you have your app open. Here's what Jesus said. It says, therefore, Jesus, he's said to them again, he's teaching them over and over again. He says, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate or I am the door, same word, for the sheep. Now, most of us were not shepherds. Are there any shepherds in the room? In those days when Jesus said, I am the gate or I am the door, they had two types of pens. They had one type of pen that was a larger pen, had taller walls, was more developed. Uh, we'll put a sheep pen up there for you. Uh, it was more in the villages and towns where shepherds would pass through. And from time to time in these larger village or town sheep, uh, sheep pens, they would have tall walls. They would have a gatekeeper, a hired hand who would sit there at night and watch over the flock. And in these sheep pens near a large city or outside of Jerusalem or Bethlehem or someplace else in Galilee, they might have at night multiple flocks of sheep in the sheep pen. Out in the countryside, there was a much different, is more, much more rustic sheep pen. Uh, the sheep pen, depending on the size of, uh, of the flock, which could be anywhere from three to 1,500, depending on the ability of the shepherd, they might just have a sheep pen that's just a couple of sticks and a couple of rocks that sheep didn't like to step over. And so as we journey through this story, we're going to see that Jesus is talking about both types of sheep pens. That if you're in the countryside, we're going to see that Jesus talks about this. The number one enemy to the sheep out in the countryside with the low walls was a wolf scaling the wall, destroying the sheep. If you go more to the larger, more corporate, if you want to put it that way, sheep pen outside of Jerusalem or outside of Bethlehem or outside of somewhere else, what you would see there was a hired hand. The number one enemy of the sheep was a thief that would go around to the backside of the sheep pen that would crawl in, throw some sheep out. And so in this mindset, Jesus begins to talk to us, talk to us and say, listen, he says, I am the door. I am the gatekeeper for my sheep. The second I am, he says, is he says, I am the good shepherd. He says, not only am I the door, I should determine uh, who goes in and who goes out. He says, the door is an actual physical thing that you open and close. The door of the country and the village or the town or the city's, uh, city's door, it was a person. And Jesus says, I am that person. But look at John chapter 10, verse 11. Notice what he says. He says, I am the good shepherd. Everybody say good shepherd. good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I don't know if you had a children's study Bible growing up, but probably this is the number one image that you would see in the Bible when it talks about Jesus being the good shepherd is him walking along carrying this lamb, maybe in your children's book. It's still probably the number one image. But notice what Jesus says in both of them. He says, both of them, he says, I am the door, not a door. I am the good shepherd, not a good shepherd. But also notice what Jesus says. He says, I am the door, but I'm not the doormat. And child of God, a lot of us treat Jesus as kind of our doormat that we roll out into the world, we live like we want to, we talk like we want to, we develop relationships like we want to, and then we feel a little dirty before we come back in the house, we want to rub our feet off on Jesus as the doormat. I want you to know Jesus says, no, he's the door. He is not your doormat, but notice what makes him such a good door and such a good shepherd. He says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd, how do you know he's good? He lays down his life for the sheep. You say, Pastor, why do you draw that out and emphasize that? Because Jesus does. If you read John chapter 10 five separate times, Jesus says, I lay down my life for the sheep. I lay down my life for the sheep. I lay down my life for the sheep. So the question for us, when it comes to Jesus being the door, Jesus being the good shepherd, who are we following today? Who are we entering into today? It's got to be Jesus and him alone. 
So now let's jump down to the end of the story. How did the religious leaders, how did the, those who were listening respond? Pick it up in verse 31. And then we're going to go back in between those two ideas and find five timeless truths. Here's what it says. It says, again, the Jewish opponents picked up stones. This is how the story ends. Picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you nothing but many good works from the Father. For which of these good works, for which of these good works do you stone me? They go, we are not trying to stone you for any of the good works. We kind of appreciate those. They replied, but for blasphemy because you, a mere man, claim to be God. So if anyone ever says, well, I love Jesus, I think he was a great teacher, man, what an incredible example, but, but he wasn't God and he didn't claim to be God. Well, let me tell you what, they are wrong. The Jews right here knew very much when he says, I am the door, he was going back to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. When he says, I am the good shepherd, he was going back to Moses. It was clear the Jewish religious leaders of that day who Jesus were talking to knew very well that Jesus was saying, I am God in the flesh, and I am the Messiah that is going to lay down his life for the sheep. And their response wasn't to embrace him, wasn't to accept him, but instead was to reject him and try to stone him. So when we come to this passage and we realize, man, two great I am's, a response of those religious leaders today, what we want to do is take and glean five principles. Part, part of my job every week is to take something that is somewhat unfamiliar to us and find five time, or a couple of timeless truths and bring them to you. Because here's what I know. Uh, I wasn't a shepherd. I didn't grow up around sheep. Let me tell you, about most of what I know about sheep is that Mary had one, and I'm not familiar with the rest of the song. But what I want to do is I want us to read and look at these sheep. And look at the shepherd, and look at the pen, and look at the door, and glean five principles from this story that apply to our life today as we build a bridge from what Jesus said to how I should live today. Here's thought number one. Don't ever forget, as you journey through this world, just like in Jesus' day, there will always be people who want to lead you astray. There will always be people that want to lead you astray. That's what Jesus says. Just pick it up in verse 1. This is how the whole conversation started. Look at it in verse 1. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees. Now, let me tell you what. Don't ever think Jesus was a doormat. He's a little salty. Uh, look at him. He starts. He goes, hey, I tell you what. You Pharisees, let me tell you what. Anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. Remember I told you the two kinds of pens? Jesus is re referencing that larger sheep pen that had multiple flocks in it each and every day. He goes, anyone that climbs over and doesn't go in the gate, he is a thief and he is a robber. He is all, they are always trying for us. Satan is always trying to steal our minds and our hearts. Continue to read. Look at verse 5. How then should we as the sheep respond? He says, but they, talking about the sheep, this is us, we should never follow a stranger. In fact, we should run away from him because we do not recognize that stranger's voice. So Jesus is saying this, as followers of Christ, there will always be those who are trying to lead us astray. There will always be those who are trying to call us away. Uh, we talked about a door today. Probably we'll put it up on the screen for you. This is probably the most recognizable door in religious history. Back on October the 31st of 1517, a guy named Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis on the castle door in Wittenberg. And there were 95 charges against the church because he felt like that over the years as the church had developed by 1517, they had developed a lot of practices that were leading people away from the gospel instead of towards the gospel, leading people away from Jesus instead of towards Jesus. And so Martin Luther showed up to the doors of the church and said, here are 95 charges I deliver against the church, and these are not found in God's Word. These are not part of the voices of God. And so I want you to know, 500 years ago, there were people who were leading God's people astray. Don't be shocked when people are trying to lead you astray today. Go back before Jesus' day. Go read this afternoon, I encourage you, to Ezekiel chapter 34. 
580 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Ezekiel was told by God, go to the political religious leaders of your day and pronounce a woe to them. And so 580 years before Jesus walked the earth and taught, God showed up to a prophet named Ezekiel, and Ezekiel was supposed to go in Ezekiel chapter 34, and he says, woe to you political and religious leaders because you lead my people astray. So now think about the timeline. 580 years before Jesus walked the earth, there were people who were wanting to lead God's sheep away. Jesus' day, there were political and religious leaders, Pharisees, Sadducees, and others who were trying to lead God's people, God's sheep, astray. 500 years ago, during the days of Martin Luther, there were some people who were trying to lead God's people astray, God's sheep astray. So that should tell us if 500 years before Jesus, people were trying to lead us astray, if during Jesus' day, people were trying to lead us astray, 500 years ago, people were trying to lead us astray, astray, should it shock us at all that there are people today trying to lead us astray? Absolutely not. That is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, listen, Pharisees, don't be a thief and a robber to try to pull us away but instead lead us to truth. Now, part of our call, listen, as good sheep is that we would listen to the good shepherd's voice, which is my second timeless truth. Not only do we need to understand and remember that there will always be someone trying to lead you astray. Don't, think, don't, don't ever doubt that. But we should always be listening to the shepherd's voice. You say, where do you see that? Right there in Jesus' words. Look at verse 2. It says, the one who enters by the gate or the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper, now remember, we're talking about the larger sheep pen, the, the village or town or city sheep pen that had multiple flocks in, opens the gate for him who, the true shepherd, and the sheep listen, everybody say listen, to his voice, and he calls them out by name and leads them out. And when he has brought them out, brought out all of his own, he goes ahead of them. His sheep follow him because they know his voice. Man, I love this. So here, here's what Jesus is doing. Now, this, this imagery would have been very familiar to the Pharisees and those listening in on the day. Is that Jesus is talking about that larger sheep pen that would have had multiple flocks. And so it would almost be a corporate sheep pen. Maybe a mall for sheep if you want to put it that way. And shepherds could store their sheep overnight. And there would be a gatekeeper who was paid money who would sit at the gate. And when you came back in the morning to gather your sheep, the gatekeeper would check you off the list and say, all right, John Mark's come back for his three sheep. And some other guy might come back for his hundred sheep. But the gatekeeper would know that you actually have a flock of sheep. Then it says the gatekeeper, the, 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 the shepherd would go in and he would begin to talk to his sheep. And it says his sheep know his voice and listen to them and listen to this. He knows them by name. If you ever feel isolated and alone and wonder if God knows, can I tell you this? He knows your name. He knows everything about you. He cares more about you than you ever thought. And our call is to listen to his voice. We want to be very aware of God's voice in our life. We want to open his word. We want to hear God's word taught. We want to sing songs that glorify God and honor God and magnify God. That's how we continue to hear God's voice. And there's some good news. Interestingly, I shared with you earlier that sheep are, are stubborn and defenseless and desperately need a, uh, a shepherd. When I first started preaching years ago, I ran across a Bible. It was kind of a preacher's handbook to, to sheepology, I guess. And, and it was really written around Psalm 23, uh, uh, the Lord is my shepherd. And really, as I looked in there and I began to read, and, and I go back to some of my old notes, that I had nothing 28 years ago good to say about sheep. Because of what I read in the book. But as I was doing some research now, scientists actually have some good news about sheep. 
Their, their IQ is actually higher than we thought. They can identify as many, 50, as many as 50 voices. They can distinguish as many as 50 voices, whether it's a good voice or a bad voice. Challenge for us. Let's know Jesus' voice so well that when Satan or someone else tries to lead us astray with what they say, we can identify that as a wrong path that we need to go down, that we don't need to go. So here, remember voices. Not only do they remember voices, they remember faces, especially faces that are associated with good rewards. So sheep ultimately know, it doesn't matter if they're in with a pen with a 1,000 or with 30, when their good shepherd walks in, and begins to talk to them, they begin to follow him because he knows their name and they know his voice. So the question for us today is, who are we following? Who are we following today? Now let's just continue to read the story. Pick it up. Notice, jump down to verse 14. Here's what Jesus says. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know, everybody say no. He says, I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. He says, I have other sheep. You say, Pastor, why do you want to bring this out? Because he's now talking about us. All right. In John chapter 10, Jesus is talking to the religious leaders of the day and the Jews of the day. But I love that even in John chapter 10, in this I am, he talks about you and me. You say, where? Look at it right here. He says, I have other sheep. Everybody say, that's us. Everybody say, that's us. Okay, good. I have other sheep. Well, pastor, who are these other sheep? That are not of this sheep pen, Judaism. He goes, I will bring them also. That's us. He says, and they too will listen to my voice, and there shall be, listen to this, one flock, not Jews and Gentiles, but one flock with one shepherd. Man, what an incredible thought. Right there in John chapter 10, in this I am, Jesus doesn't just talk about the Jews and the Jewish leaders of the day. He talks about you and me as Gentiles. And he goes, I have other sheep that are not of this flock, talking about you and me and Gentiles. And he goes, I will call them. They will be my sheep. They will be one flock with one shepherd. That is Jesus. Now, I want you to know a lot of times what we think about Jesus and how I often think about Jesus. I want Jesus to always cuddle me and always encourage me and always forgive me. Isn't that what we always want? You know, one of the tasks of a good shepherd is to shear the sheep. How many of you know that? And just FYI, sheep don't like to be sheared, but they need to be sheared. Look at this image. We've got a little before and after picture. You can actually Google this. Go to Wikipedia. This, this is the world record holder of sheep. It had gotten lost on the, in the Australian countryside. And when the sheep wool is not sheared, it puts the sheep in danger. They get less agile. They're more prone to get turned upside down and not right themselves. They, uh, if they are walking through crevices and rocks, they're prone to getting their wool caught. Not only that, they can't take care of their young. They can't take care of their children. And they will develop pests and insects that will burr into their skin, go into their ears, their ears and ultimately kill the sheep. So what happens? Part of a good shepherd... Every spring, a good shepherd will bring the sheep to him. They do not like it. And he will shear the sheep and sell the wool. But part of the reason why he shears the sheep is it allows for new growth of new wool, and it's also for the betterment of the sheep. And so I want us to know, much like this sheep, there are times that you and I just kind of go our own way and do our own thing and live how we want to live. And when we come back to the good shepherd, we come back to the father, maybe we're a prodigal that's been gone away, God's going to pull you close. And he's going to say, let me shear this off. And you're not going to like it. He's going to say, man, I don't like that relationship. I don't like that sin. We don't like that way that you talk. And there are some things that God is going to shear off of us, and we will not like it. 
But when God takes something in your life and he removes it because it's detrimental to you, it's detrimental to your kids, it's detrimental uh, to your relationships, it's detrimental to your job, but understand when God shears some things off, God's doing it for your own good and for new growth. And there are some of us here today, we've come back to the Father so often and so often, and all of a sudden, He pulls us in. And by the way, especially in, in, in years gone by before we had all the machinery, you want to know what would happen? A, a shepherd would sit down with the shears behind his back, and he would call the sheep over by name one at a time. And as they would come over, he would hug them, and then he would get them in a headlock. It's not like signing up for shearing on our app today. And they didn't like it. You know what? They didn't realize it was good for them. But all of a sudden, the new growth happened. Then summer was right after spring. Spring is when they shear the sheep, when they go into the heat of the desert. And it's easier for them to control their body temperature and also take care of the young for the mothers. So, child of God, if you, if you begin to make your journey back to God the Father, don't be shocked if he pulls you in close. Maybe gets you in a headlock. It begins to shear some things off. God begins to say, you know what? I don't want you to do this anymore. I don't want you to say this anymore. I want you to back out of this, and I want you to grow. Here's a third timeless truth when we think about it. Is Jesus, the good shepherd, the door, is the only one who brings us ultimate fulfillment? That's what everybody wants in life. I want you to know that's what I want in life. I don't want fame. I want fortune. I don't want any of that. Just give me fulfillment. God, just let me do what you've called me to do. In my church, in my family, with my kids, just fulfill me. I, I love what Jesus says. He talks about your fulfillment and mine. He says, verse 9, he says, I am the gate or I am the door. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Everybody say amen. amen. Jesus, I'm the door. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. Man, that's the idea, moving in, moving out throughout life. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. What does Satan want to do with you? He wants to steal you. He wants to kill you. He wants to destroy you. He, he'll, he'll lure you out. He'll pretend he's your friend, but ultimately he will destroy you and kill you. But Jesus says, I have come that you might have life. That's eternal life. And you might have life to the full. That's ultimate fulfillment. Man, what is Jesus saying? He goes, listen, I want more than anything you to be fulfilled in life. Now, let me tell you what, Satan will promise fulfillment in this place or that place, or you'll go down this road or that road. You'll find out it's a dead end. There's no joy. There's no happiness. There's no fulfillment. And Jesus is going to say, listen, I told you that Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that you might have life. Yes, eternal life, but also fulfillment in today's life. And so as we journey, you say, Pastor, what gives me fulfillment in life today? Well, first of all, good news right here. From Jesus, not me. From your good shepherd, not just your pastor. Jesus says, your past sins are forgiven. That's fulfillment. Listen, there are a bunch of people that are sitting here probably with the guilt and the weight of the world about things you've done and things you've said and things you struggle with. Can I tell you, part of fulfillment is to be able to look back on those things and know that God won't hold those against you. Part of fulfillment is knowing that where I'm headed, according to Revelation 21, is a place where there's no more sin, no more death, no more tears, no more crying, that all will go away, which leads me in this space right here. Past forgiven, future is secure. Then I can live in such a way that if I keenly listen in to the voice of the good shepherd and I let him be the door that leads me in and out, then I can truly walk in such a way that I'm fulfilled in my earthly relationships but also fulfilling with, fulfilled in my calling with God. Yes, there will still be times that the shepherd will shear us, clean up some things, but that always provides an opportunity for new growth. Here's number four. Just reading these verses, Jesus is the only one who truly cares about you. 
Man, I've seen it over and over again. And part of what it means to be a pastor is you sit down and hear people's story. Particularly today with young people, whether it's on social media or whether it's here or there or, or other people that I'll sit with someone and, and they've been led astray. They've been led towards this person or that person or this sin or that sin or this addiction towards that addiction. And what happens is they get drawn off sides and Satan might lure them in, but at the end of the day, the rug gets pulled out from under them. See, Jesus is the only one that truly cares for you. That when he asks you to follow him, he's leading you to greener pastures. Satan will ask you to follow him He'll lead you to a place where he can steal from you, he can destroy you, and he can kill you. You, you say, well, what is, pastor, what is pastor talking about? Jesus is the only one who truly cares for me. He's just using the same analogy. Look at John chapter 10, verse 12. Pick it up. It says, the hired hand, so what is this? He's going back to that village, that town, that larger, um, that larger place where someone might be a corporate shepherd who hires someone to take care of a sheep. He says, the hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. It says, then the wolf attacks the flock and it scatters. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Now, I love this idea. Jesus just being honest. There are always going to be people that show up in your life and pretend to be a good shepherd. But he says in those days, the hired hands, when the wolf shows up, all the hired hand cares about is the money. He doesn't care about the wolves. That's why it's important that we understand that Jesus said five times, I lay down my life, I lay down my life, I lay down my life, I lay down my life. Jesus doesn't want your money, he wants your life. That's what Jesus wants. He says, I laid down my life for you, will you lay down your life for me? There are always going to be hired hands that show up in your life and say, we are in this until we're not. You ever heard the phrase that says, man, there's no, no honor among thieves, right? And that's what he's saying. He's saying a hired hand is going to show up, oh, come this way, do this until things get hard. And then they're going to abandon you. They're going to turn away from you. Man, we need to depend on Jesus as our shepherd. You say, Pastor, that's hard. The other night, Friday night, we had a cane concert. I don't know how many of you were at the cane concert. This place was packed. And it was full. And Gene and I were standing right up there, what used to be the old sound booth. And for $50 a Sunday, you can buy a seat up there, by the way. And our deacons look QR code. They'll bring you popcorn. That's not true. $100, we can make it true. Gene and I were sitting up there. And if you saw my social media, you saw me post it. And they knew many, much of the crowd was a young crowd that was here. But a lot of moms and dads too. But a lot of people struggling. And they sing a song right now that says, On my best day, I'm a child of God. On my worst day, I'm a child of God. And they had the whole group just singing that. On my best day, I'm a child of God. On my worst day, I'm a child of God. And Gene and I were just struck as we were sitting up there. Because I have a buddy whose daughter was here that night. And she really struggled with emotional hurt and heartache. Not uncommon for me to get a text from him, good week, or next week, struggle week, pray for me, and good week, and struggle week. I just remember sitting up there going, you know, there are a lot of people that on their best day, they know they're a child of God. On their worst day, they wonder. Can I just tell you what Jesus is saying right here is your good shepherd? Young people, look at me. On your best day, you're a child of God. On your worst day, you're a child of God. But adults, this isn't just for them. Can you just listen for a second? Jesus says, on your best day, you're a child of God. On your worst day, you're a child of God. And here's a fifth timeless truth that I see out of this passage. Jesus is ultimately the gateway to salvation. 
He said, where do you see this? Just continue to read on. All we're doing is walking through John chapter 10. Notice what Jesus said in verse 9. He says, I am the gate or the door, not the doormat. Whoever enters through me, I've already read this, will be saved. Now jump down to verse 27. He says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them. We listen to his voice. He knows them. They follow me. That's our call. He goes, I give to them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will ever snatch them out of my hand. Look at verse 29. My Father who has given them to me is greater than them all, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Then he says, I and the Father are one. And then they pick up stones to stone him. That's what we read earlier. Jesus said, I and the Father are absolutely one. Now, as you think about this, Jesus says, if you are his sheep and you listen to his voice and you come by faith, you are saved. But the question for a lot of people, and people will ask me from time to time, is say, Pastor, do you believe in the eternal security of the believer? Do you believe this is a theological point that hopefully you'll take notes on? Do you believe that if a person is truly saved, they've truly given your life to Christ, Christ has has become their good shepherd, will they always be saved or can they lose that salvation? That's a great question. Let me give you Jesus' answer. He gives you basically four reasons why once you are truly saved, you might need to be sheared along the way. How many of us understand that? But you will ultimately be saved. You say, Pastor, does Jesus answer you? Right here in a couple of verses. Give you four thoughts. Number one, why do I believe eternal security is eternal security? By definition. Write this down. You might want to just write this down. If you go look up that original Greek word that is translated eternal life, that word eternal means eternal. Just that simple. The definition of eternal is eternal. If I come up to you and I say, I say, hey, I want to give you my car forever. You say, how long forever? How long can I use it forever? And a week later, I take it back. Have I just lied to you? Absolutely. That's not forever. Is Jesus a liar? Is God a liar? So if Jesus has given you eternal life, and if it's not eternal life, if you do something, if you get enough wool or junk in your wool that Jesus takes away your eternal life, that makes Jesus a liar. So I believe in ter- eternal security because he uses the word eternal. Second reason, listen to this, is the word give. He says, I give to them eternal life. Salvation is a gift from God. It's not something I earned. So here's the point. If Jesus gave it to me and I didn't earn it at the beginning, I can't unearn it at the end. Does that make sense? If I don't earn salvation by works, I can't lose salvation by my works. Let me give you a third reason just from these. It's the promise that Jesus made. He says, once I give to them eternal life, he says, no one, everybody say no one. No one can ever snatch you out of his hand and you will never perish. We'll never perish. So that's the third reason. Listen, Jesus made a promise. No one will ever snatch you out of his hands. And here's the fourth reason just from this passage. Because eternal security is in God's hands and not in my hands. I'm going to say that again. Eternal security is in God's hands. It's not in my hands. What did Jesus say? All who the Father gives to me are in my hand, and no one can snatch them out of my hand. And then he follows that up, if you didn't get it, that your salvation is in God's hands, not in your hands. He says, and not only that, my, the Father who is greater than them all, we're in his hands. So when you think about your eternal security, eternal means eternal. Salvation was a gift. Jesus made a promise, and your salvation is in God's hands not yours. Let's close in prayer, and then we've got several that we're going to have the opportunity to celebrate in baptism. God, thank you so much for these two I am's we've looked at today, that Jesus is the door to salvation, that Jesus is the good shepherd of the sheep. God, let us all in this room and online be the kind of people that have gone through the door for salvation by faith. 
but then constantly and consistently listen to the voice of God and follow him and him alone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Were you glad you're in God's house today?